So as president of Florida Realtors, it is a privilege to be here today to speak on behalf of our 238,000 members. And as stated before, that makes us the largest professional trade association in the state of Florida. But that also makes us the largest state realtor association in the entire United States. This marks the 12th edition of the World Strategic Forum, and Florida Realtors is honored to be a part of this tradition in collaborative intelligence gathering and thought leadership. In fact, I'm proud to note that some 80 plus realtor members will be sharing this experience as they participate both today and tomorrow. Our realtor members understand the value of collaboration and international partnerships. The past few years have shown us all, now more than ever, our economies, our businesses, and our lives truly are intertwined. In 2022, Florida's real estate, finance, and insurance sectors accounted for $260 billion in the state's gross domestic product. According to Statistica, Statistica, that was the number one sector. Real estate drives Florida economy, and the Sunshine State continues to be a popular draw for both national and international investors, even in times of fluctuating markets. Florida remained the top destination for foreign buyers purchasing U.S. residential real estate in 2022. Now listen to this statistic. In 2022, of all the foreign buyers in the United States, 23% of them bought in the state of Florida. 23%. Global business and real estate investment are key to Florida's future. One of Florida Realtors' goals is to strengthen the voice of real estate across the globe, which we believe is vital to the industry's future growth. We continue to seek and establish strong relationships and lead international real estate organizations in countries like Canada, Spain, Turkey, France, Dubai, Germany, Brazil, Mexico, and so many more. <laughs> Participating in such leading edge events like the Miami World Strategic Forum enables Florida Realtors and our members to learn from experts and use that knowledge for growth and development personally, professionally, in business, and on a global scale. Who knows what 2024 is going to bring? Most likely there's going to be some challenges, there's going to be some changes, but there's probably going to be some investment opportunities. Working together to share information through a global platform, as we do here doing, during the World Strategic Forum, helps deepen our mutual understanding strengthen our connections, and develop innovative ideas for the coming year. Just like you, I am eager to hear from our, our panel of expert speakers about what's in store for the alternative investment landscape. Please join me in a warm Miami welcome to all. Thank you. Hi, how are you? My name is Rich Rothman, and I'm the publisher of Global Miami Magazine and Coral Gables Magazine and some other magazines, Latin Trade, Latin CEO, South Florida CEO, and my Aunt Sophie is one of my investors from years ago. Okay, having said all of that, I am delighted to be here and moderate the Alternatives Investment Landscape. And everybody has an interest in that right now, primarily because when you look at the landscape, when you look at the landscape, things have really changed dramatically or maybe they haven't. If you're Patty Chayefsky, and you're talking about what happened in the 76, and you look at the movie Network, and you listen to Howard Beale losing it, and you realize nothing's really changed. We're not in a, in a, in a depression right now, thank God. We are depressed in many ways, and, and the ladies and gentlemen up here are going to help us to understand where to put our money and how we can invest and how things have changed. But it's, it's, a, very, it's a very unusual landscape. We're involved right now with things that have occurred that we didn't even think about a few years ago. Everybody knows the word supply chain. Everyone knows supply chain. Everybody's a shipper now. Everybody's involved with chips. Everybody understands the nuances of what's happening to make globalization work, not work, and why they can't find bounty on their, on their shelves in publics. I mean, people know that. They're involved, they're engaged, they wanna know what's going on. So I'm delighted to be able to sit here 
and, and face all of you and, and, and lead a discussion because these are the experts. Okay, with us today, and I know you want to meet them, uh, jean Vieve Lavelle, the founder and CEO of AgriLedger. I got that. All right, I'm so proud. Spanish for 10 years, I did not take French. Uh, David Blumberg, David's the founder and managing partner of Blumberg Capital. Randy Smallwood, CEO of Wheaton Precious Minerals. And we have Nico Sparks, the chief technology officer of Pixel Lime. And we're going to be talking about, and this is really good for me because it scares the hell out of me, is AI. Anybody concerned about AI? Raise your hand. I want to see that. Get him up there. I want because he's going to have to address that later. So here we go. So let's, let's just talk about the landscape first and get a couple of minutes in that. And maybe you can introduce yourself. Uh, John, would you please explain a little bit who you are? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning. I don't know. My body doesn't know anymore. Just got it back from Dubai. Uh, so I am the founder and CEO of AgriLedger. And as the name talks about, it's about agriculture and ledgerizing. But it's really more than that. It's about how do we rebalance, really, the wealth? And how do we make sure that we know where our food is coming from and that we know food is going to come? If not, uh, the pandemic taught us anything else, it was about supply chain. But really, we need to be looking at this idea of value chain. So by using blockchain technology, we look to really redistribute wealth. And if we recall, not long ago, the farmer was the most richest person in town. Nowadays, they tend to be the poorest. So how do we cre recreate financial ability to invest into the farm and also into the production of the goods that we need and then really create assurance for all of us that we know where our food is coming from. Now, Miami is the biggest port for import trade, which means it also is very subject to a lot of the food fraud that is happening. And that has a cost, not only a cost to human, but it has a cost to our economy. So this is really about how do we start looking at policies? How do we get data? So it goes into the AI to then create better information. That's terrific. By the way, you know, when I went to Syracuse University for too many years that I want to mention, uh, because it rained every day. I've not, I had seven years of rain, if you understand upstate New York. Uh, in the winter. We have two days of summer, seven years of rain. But all my neighbors, when I got out of the first year, I was outside. We were all farmers. Mm -hmm. And they were the hardest working, most wonderful people I ever met in my life. And the most underappreciated people. It's just unbelievable. The kids would start at 4.30 in the morning. They'd have breakfast. Then they'd go to school. Then they'd come back, run chores, do homework, go back to bed and do it over seven days a week, except for the school. It's just an amazing group of people. And we have to, it, this is really, really good. You're in the city of blockchain. Yes. Miami gets it. We get it. David, David Blumberg, uh, been around for a long time, very successful. Gentlemen, tell us a bit about yourself and your company. Sure. Uh, about 30 years ago, I founded Blumberg Capital. We're an early stage and growth stage venture capital firm. We're based in San Francisco, New York, Miami, and Tel Aviv. We have about 66 companies across the world uh, where we invest, mostly North America, so US and Canada. Thanks for the group organizing here. Uh, Europe and Israel. Um, all of our investments are in technology. They're all in the software area, what we call as the SaaS model, software as a service. Almost everything is B2B, business to business. It's an area that I think, speaking macroeconomically, uh, is a good place to be right now. I'm very nervous. I think some of the previous speakers have talked about the consumer about to fall off the edge in terms of um, their savings are going away from the handouts that were done by many governments around the world uh, during the lockdowns and so on. Um, credit card debt is at an all-time high, things like that. So the consumer sector, we stay away from. We also stay away from generally hardware projects. We like software because it has high margins and it's very replicable. And then um, Ambassador Dobransky spoke beautifully about energy and the need for energy. We totally agree. We need all kinds of energy. Every single type should be on the table and be promoted by the United States and other governments because many people in the world have no energy. But I'm going to talk more about tech. So the energy should be promoted everywhere. But in the tech world, we're here to help. Uh, it's a bit of a tale of two cities, best times and worst of times. Um, but there's help coming from the tech world. We bring productivity. Our firm, Bloomberg Capital, mainly backs companies that sell to the global 5,000 organizations, largest organizations in the world. 
they have very strong balance sheets, so it's a good place right now to be selling into relative to the consumer and other sectors. They also have incredible strong needs for productivity enhancement. It's very hard, no offense to the large companies, to innovate in a big organization. Most of you know that. It's much easier to innovate in a small group, equity motivated, young people leading the way uh, with the freshest skills out of university graduate programs in computer science and STEM. So that's what we're focused to invest. And uh, we'll talk later about risk on, risk off. The rise in interest rates has really hurt a lot of the world for the real estate and all that world. The large corporations have stronger balance sheets than at any previous time in, in uh, recent crash history. The 2008, they were weaker. The 2001 crash, they were weaker. They're very strong right now. So selling into this market, we think, is the best place and will deliver benefits for everybody because productivity is the gift that keeps giving, making everything more affordable, faster, cheaper, better. That's it. Any questions? No, just going on. Randy Smallwood. Randy is the, uh, is the CEO of Wheaton Precious Minerals. And this is something that everybody has an interest in right now. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so Randy Smallwood uh, founded uh, Wheaton Precious Metals, was part of the founding team uh, just over 20 years ago. But uh, perhaps more importantly, or more recently, I just finished off three years as the chair of the World Gold Council. And, uh, and um, the initiatives that we're doing at the World Gold Council, it's the largest advocacy group for gold in terms of what gold represents to society. And so as we, as we talk about alternative investments, I, you know, gold is, in my eyes, the original critical metal, the original critical mineral. And, and we and everyone around the world has always measured things in gold in terms of it's one uniform measure of value that's, that's universally accepted around the world. But uh, some of the initiatives uh, that, that, that we've uh, undertaken at the World Gold Council are very exciting for gold on a go-forward basis, where we're basically bringing gold ownership into the 21st century. So we've got an initiative there called Gold 247, which stands for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we're basically incorporating blockchain into gold ownership, where instead of having to actually move the gold, you can move uh, digital tokens that have a, a direct connection back to physical gold stored in a vault. And, uh, and it's fractionable, it's got good provenance, good fungibility in terms of uh, high levels of trust and movement. And um, there's a number of for-profit enterprises that have already moved down this path. But, but as the World Gold Council and a group of what we call our own version of the G20, which is the, uh, the 20 largest sort of institutions that are involved in that, from bullion banks, trading banks, regulatory authorities, uh, we're moving forward down this path and expect that within the next year and a half, two years, you will see a, a serious alternative uh, uh, way of owning uh, gold. And, and, and we think that that increase in demand, especially in, in the face of today's economy, and, and I think underlying weaknesses in the fiat, fiat currencies around the world uh, truly will open up some incredible opportunities for, for gold. The company Wheaton uh, that, I'm, that I'm here representing, Wheaton Precious Metals, 20 years ago, we came up with a new way of investing into the gold space. We created what's called the streaming business model, which means that, that we invest into good quality mines. Now, I'm an entrepreneurial geologist, and, and so my focus is on making sure that we invest into good assets. And that's what our whole company is. We're a total of 40 employees in the company, but we're, we trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, London Stock Exchange at about a $20 billion market cap. I think we might be one of the largest market cap per employee companies in the, in, on the New York Stock Exchange. And what we do is provide low risk access to healthy precious metals production. Uh, we take all the cost risk out of investing into the space, and yet we deliver all the, the good benefits of resource investing. And we do think that with the, with the, with the changes that, that we see happening and the, and the pressure that we see on fiat currencies around the world, it's time for gold to shine again. And uh, we think that Wheaton, our company, is the best way to, to get exposure to that shine. So, There you go. And finally, but not last, Nico Sparks, Chief Technology Officer with Pixel, Lime, and he's the gentleman who's going to tell us about AI eventually. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my company, Pixel Lime, uh, more or less focuses on productivity in the corporate sector. Uh, so we're not so much uh, in the generative AI space as we are in the interactive AI space. 
And, and what I mean by that is we develop technology that more or less mimics human behavior in a working environment. And, and, and the reason this is important in AI is because we think as productivity is increased, um, we're able to um, pursue more humanistic endeavors, uh, so to speak, right? We, we all know that time is our most valuable commodity and the number one thing that we do at Pixel Lime is try to increase productivity for our clients so that they have more time to uh, pursue other, uh, you know, things that life, uh, you know, has to, uh, to provide. So it's kind of what we do. Okay, so let's get into it now. And here, here's the situation. So we've been listening to a number of speakers here as well as uh, previous speakers. And we're talking about right now, if, if you're trying to figure out where to be and where's safe and what can you do, and you, know, you, you get home and you turn on the TV, and, you, and, and after about seven minutes of watching the news, you, you can't do this anymore. You, you just grab your dog and you go for a walk. You have to do that. But we're, we seem to be in a very tumultuous environment. I mean, to say the least, and I'm probably euphemizing the whole thing. So when you look what's out there in the landscape, how does that affect the, the, the concept of alternatives? Because people are looking for alternatives. People look for new ideas. People look for new markets. They look over the horizon. I mean, if you think about it, that's one of the reasons Miami is so successful, because we're one of those innovative cities that, you know, back in the late 70s, early 80s, we looked over the horizon, we said, where are we going to be? And we said, we can do better. And we did. So when you look out now, and, and we have all these different people, whether they're in the ag business, or we're in investment business with B2B, and we're raising money, or we're going to be involved in, in precious mi minerals and so forth, which everybody understands right now because they're saying, my God, if, you know, we have EVs, we got to have batteries, we have to have minerals, we have to have lithium, we have to have cobalt, we're going to have to have all these things. Well, how, the, how do I get involved in that? Do I want to get involved in that? And then you have finally AI. Is a, if AI... Is, I mean, try and talk to anybody on the phone right now and try and get somebody to talk to you. It's a human being. I mean, I feel like I'm in the beginning of the last Marigold Hotel when <laughs> Judy Deutsch is to waiting on the phone to speak to somebody. and She's only talking to, hello, hang on, hello, hang on. It's an AI person. So having said that, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit. David, I'd like you to start with that. What, what do you see out there and how is it affecting your environment? Sure. So first, how many people think they know what AI means? Raise your hands. Okay, so you'll permit me a two-minute tutorial. <clears throat> Artificial intelligence is better known, I think, by a Berkeley professor as augmented intelligence, because it should augment what we have here in our gray matter. It's not artificial like artificial ingredients, which everybody thinks is bad. It's actually very helpful. It's essentially pattern analysis done at speed, at scale, at a cost that's very, very economical. So it is a tool for us, just as tractors replaced horses and bulls in the fields, artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence will help us do our jobs better. And they'll be able to do things that we could never do on our own. So it's a really generally a force for positive. So I'm in favor of advancing it, leaning in, not leaning back. At my children's uh, school, they're starting to teach them how to query ChatGPT, which is a good thing. I don't want them to go away from it, don't use it. I want them to embrace it. As Bill Clinton said, embrace change. We, we have no other choice. We really have to move forward. We can't move backward. So the basic kinds of AI are three. Traditional machine learning analyzes rows and columns of data. That is used for pattern analysis, and it's used for better underwriting methods in insurance and banking, better pathology analysis of cancer and so on, better um, agricultural uh, techniques, better mining techniques. It can be used in almost anything. So that's machine learning traditional. Then we get to deep learning. It has a couple branches. The middle one I would call as looking at videos and sound and anything that's more three-dimensional than just a typical rows and columns. So deep learning is very good for healthcare uh, analysis and pathology and things like that, diagnostics. And then the newest one that uh, Nico uh, mentioned is generative AI. That will do the following, and I'm going to let you practice. If I, uh, generative AI, the main algorithm is the next logical word that follows. So I'm going to say it, and then you're going to give me the right word. To be or not to, very good, be. So that's a generative AI algorithm that's finding what's the next logical word or according to all the data that it looks and mines from the internet. And AI has three base components. It has 
technology of hardware from companies like NVIDIA, which make the speed of processing very fast. It requires massive amounts of data. Interestingly, about 95% of data after it's stored and archived is never looked at again, mainly because we didn't have the tools or the technologies at cost to analyze it. Now we can. And the third part are these algorithms, machine learning, deep learning, and generative AI. That's a two minute, a little bit longer than two. I'm impressed. Let's hear it for David. Very good. All right, let's, let's get back to the, uh, well, not get back, we're into it, we're discussing it. And I do want to get back to AI, and I want to have a conversation on that later uh, with Nico. But let, let's talk about the landscape that's out there, the seriousness, seriousness of it, and how people are looking at it with their future. Because we can't deal with the past, we can only deal with right now and the future. So, jean -Pierre. Yeah, so uh, we are going through a different impasse in the last few, I'd say, last couple of years the crypto assets have gone down in favor. But however, something that's coming out from a blockchain standpoint is what they're calling real world assets. So where you're capturing information, so as was spo spoken about the gold, you're creating truth, which are then put on chain and can provide information. So I know that we talked about, we were not going to talk about energy. Energy is something which is major, not only in our everyday life, but we need to think about farming and producing energy poverty and water poverty are the two biggest, uh, as they call, obstacle for them. But we can also create incentives for them to be able to do the right thing. So we talk about regenerative uh, agriculture, which is no tilling, which means it's going to have an effect on how much they produce. But if we can get somebody to produce with quality, we will all be willing to pay more. And if we think about it further, now those are commoditized information that can allow for better investment in agriculture. Up to now, when we look at agriculture, less than 10% of investment goes into agriculture, and none of it is at the level of the farmer, the base farmer. Why is that? Because there isn't enough information to have clarity of the risk. Now, if you start using technologies such as blockchain, AI, drone, sensors, all of those things put together, you start now having data which is rich enough that you can then understand what is your risk, what is the risk to repay, and also what are the risks even to weather, because we have weather pattern that we can understand, and that lets you know if the commodity that is expected will be making to market, what are the obstacles to getting to market, which now means what are the investments that we need to do in infrastructure? So you start having more details. And it's not what I call a greater south solution. It's even needed here in the greater north. How do we get our farmers, our producers, which are actually 80% of them considered smallholder, to get access to the funding that is necessary? And how do we get those capital sitting with those banks and those investment companies to be distributed in the right way. And that's going to involve everything from the commodities that they create, but also the carbon credit. Everybody's screaming about net zero. Well, we, and also another big scream is most companies want to know what their scope three. So if people don't know what scope three is, this is the supply chain effect on your net zero. And you can't control that because somebody else is doing it. But if you can now prove what they're doing, then you yourself can also benefit. So I see it's an all around circular opportunity there. It is an amazing scenario. I mean, the farmers, if you think about it, they're agronomists, they're scientists, they're weathermen and women, because certainly you're at the mercy of the weather. They have to be financiers in the sense because they have to underwrite and ensure what they have because one bad season can wipe out a family farm. And I, and I knew a lot of them in upstate New York when I was there. I was in Camillus, New York. If you know where Camillus is, I, God bless you if you know where that is. But, um, uh, but they were amazing people. But the truth of the matter is they need to be on the forefront of all the technology that's out there with the X's and zeros and getting that data so they can stay ahead of the game exactly. because it's all about the data. Randy, it's interesting when we're talking about minerals, and I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but suddenly it just popped in my head is that one of the reasons years ago that JetBlue did so well, and this may not be exactly what you're talking about, but I'm just going to throw it out and you can say, Rich, you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but one of the reasons JetBlue and, and, JetBlue and, and Southeast 
uh, Southwest Airlines did so well is that they bought futures. They bought futures for fuel. It was a brilliant idea. I mean, this is a number of years ago now. They bought five years worth of futures. So they paid this when everybody else was paying that. And the, and the balance sheet uh, at Southwest Airlines for a long, long time, that's why they loaded your plane so fast. Everyone's doing great. The guys out there are putting your stuff on and the, the pilots are getting off on time. The flight attendants are treating you great. Everybody was doing well because they had a different idea on how to do things. Did I get yeah. something that kind of makes sense? Well, that, that's really good if you buy low and, and then deliver into a higher market. It, it can go both ways. Uh, and commodities do go both ways. But the, you know, the one thing that I will say, and it fits a lot with what Genevieve is talking about on the agricultural side, hard assets, uh, the resources that we consume, whether they're grown or whether they're extracted, um, the connectivity that, that we need to deliver to society and, and I really do think that, you know, um, uh, systems like blockchain are a really good way of making that connection so that you can actually be a little bit more selective about what you're investing into and understand what, what, what uh, you know, what needs you're satisfying towards that society. And from an investing perspective, it allows you to be a lot more selective to responsible farmers, to responsible mining companies, to actually know where your product is coming from. And I do really think that embracing this, this, um, uh, this, this level of information that will come from, uh, you know, all the way from the fields where the farmers are actually producing the crops, from the mines where the miners are actually producing the minerals that we all need as part of society, being able to bring that information all the way forward and provide good, strong provenance so that you as a consumer, you as an investor, fully understand the costs and benefits that that product that you're consuming comes into. I think that's the real opportunity that we're going to see here is to actually be able to just elevate the level of information, the level of knowledge that, that we as a society have about you know, the products that we consume in terms of going forward. And so it's, it's one of the key things that I think is really um, exciting about what I see coming over the next five to 10 years. The, the, the technology is there. It's a matter of now building up the systems, which is what you're doing in the farming space and what we're trying to do in the, in, at least in the gold space, but it's, it's applicable to the, to the entire resource sector. And being able to elevate that level of knowledge means that responsible farmers, responsible mining companies, re responsible resource extraction companies will prosper uh, on a, on a go-forward basis. The other challenge that, that this all works towards and why it's, it's so important to be investing into the hard assets like farming, like mining, like the resources side, is that there's, um, there's only so much space on this planet. And, uh, and so, you know, it's, it makes a lot of sense to focus on those that are using their footprint to the best benefit, to the, to the maximum benefit for all the stakeholders all the way around. And so, so it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a great time to be looking at hard assets in my eyes. Well stated. Nico, when, when you're out in California and you're talking to all your, you have great companies that you work with, you know, and, and as it relates to AI and, and the servicing of that and the landscape that's out there, are the questions that you're getting from the people who want to work with you different than they were, let's say, five years ago? Do they seem more acute right now and more on top of their game than they were then because of all the data that they're being overwhelmed with? You know, that's kind of a... Uh twofold question. You know, for my employees, I'd say that the number of coders that we have on staff has probably dropped about 65%, right? Because, you know, with AI, you know, once we set that model, we set that template, you, you know, um, we don't, we no longer need those coders. That being said, it frees them up, uh, their time up to do more creative type of coding. So, so the process and the benefit of, of AI and, and how it's affecting our core is, you know, nothing but positive. In terms of our clients and, and what they're looking for, it's, it's efficiency, right? So uh, most of our clients, they want vertical integration from the, from the top down. And, and what I mean by that is they want to know that their customer service feeds into their supply chain, their supply chain feeds into uh, their forward facing business. And it just has to be so that uh, it's in a manner that if we analyze their data sufficiently, we're able to help them deliver 
what they need at the time they need it to those customers. Okay. So let me, let me take a, another step, and now let's get into a little bit the, some of the challenges of alternate investments. Now, let me just give me take 30 seconds. So I'm in the media business. I've been in the media business for a long, well, all right, 1977. All right, I stopped teaching college. I met Sylvan Meyer. He taught me the business. I've been in the magazine business, newspaper business, working with Stephen Brill and Eddie Wasserman over the years in the Miami Broward and Palm Beach Review. And I do radio. So I've been, you know, I'm in, I've been around doing this media stuff. But when you do what I do, so you, I'm an alternative investment. When I go out there, I need an angel investor. I need somebody who's smart as a whip, has a lot of money because, and Dave, I'm going to have David address this first in a second, because you have to be a qualified investor for certain things. And, and I have to work with SEC documents. If I take money from somebody who isn't qualified and I run to the bank and put their money in, first of all, the attorney I'm working with is going to get disbarred. You know, Chase is going to get upset with me and throw me out. So you've got to have certain things, that criteria. It's not an easy process. It's a very hard process. I've had meetings where someone would say to me, how much do you require? This is when I did Latin Trade Magazine, which was enormously successful in the 90s. And, and, and I told him what I needed. And he said, it was like the big fablage on Saturday Night Live. He just went into this mode, you know? And then, he, and then he just got up and he walked out. My partner and I are sitting there saying, where do you go? And, and, and he said he, he went for a Coke. He never came back. I mean, that's the level that you operate. It's so demeaning. It's so hard. But you need a specific type of an investor. That's my point. David, the landscape for alternative investments is a little bit different. Okay. Well, how many folks in the audience are investors? Okay. That's the wrong answer. Every single one of you is an investor. Every single hand should have gone up. You know that, right? You're either active investors like me and some of the others, or you're a passive investor through managers or through stock market or through 401k. So we're all investors. We all should be really paying attention, leaning forward uh, to this question. It's very, very important. What most people do, and I think you commented on it a, a bit, Mr. Smallwood, is that many people who are retail investors get scared when they should be doubling down, and they get over-enthusiastic when they should be pulling back. It's a natural human tendency. So my uh, starting point about it's a tale of two cities is very important to think about. Um, most of the best companies in our portfolio, Bloomberg Capital, which is early stage investing in uh, software companies, we've had nine unicorns, which is a company that starts at zero, little startup, and they get up to over a billion US dollars value before they go public. We've had nine of those. Most of them, seven, were invested in, in depression times, not depression, recession times. Uh, so it's very important to not get afraid when the going gets bad. We like to say about the Marines, that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. So. The risk on trade that was for the last 15 years, because governments all over the world were giving easy money through what they call modern monetary theory, which is basically reward the politicians by giving lots of money to your friends, and doesn't work out very well in the long run. So we've blown it in the past, and now we're suffering some consequences. Multiples of revenue, multiples of earnings are down across the stock markets around the world and across the private sector companies. So we're able to buy cheaper. Generally, that's good. So if you're buying right now, you're in a better position than you were for the last several years. You might have thought things were great, but they were overinflated. The prices were too high. They weren't realistic. Now things are coming more toward realism. And I always urge people to look at historically at the multiples before you're buying anything, whether it's gold or any other thing. Look at the historical multiples. Where are you? And is there any change factor, regulatory, sociodemographic, uh, others that are going to cause a jump shift in that ratio. If not, then look to those uh, historical norms to understand where you are in the cycle. And what I like about investing in early stage companies is that they're always inventing something new that is needed by other people. So watch out on the valuations. Don't get afraid when things look bad. That's the time to probably be leaning forward and investing. And um, keep your wits about you and get a good advisor. The terrific. One of the things that David said is that you, you can't panic. I mean, it's, it's interesting. In, in my environment with my partner, J.P. Faber, maybe some of you know J.P. for all these years. He's been my partner and editor-in-chief of 12 magazines. And we've been to get, we got old together. It's amazing. But we have an attitude because we're an entrepreneurial environment. I mean, I don't, except for a stint at, when I was a VP at Blockbuster for a while. 
But other than that, I've always done my, my own thing. That's another whole story. It requires a martini. But, um, but, uh, but, but the point of the matter is that we have an attitude. And the attitude is sort of like a Star Trek episode. It was the OK Corral episode where somebody was, it's, it's in your mind. If you believe the bullets are real, that there, someone's going to shoot at you, then you're going to get hurt. If you, if you don't believe they're real, you 100% believe it, you know it's in your mind, no matter what happens, you're going to get through the tough situation, you're going to come out on the other side. That's the attitude we have as entrepreneurs. We were nuts, we were, we we're serious about what we do, we understand the marketplace and we're willing to take the risk because we look for the reward and we love that reward as it comes down. Jean-Pierre, let me ask you this. Who's your, best, who's your best client? In this day and age, given what's out there, and they're looking for opportunities, who's your best client? I hate to say it, the banks. It's the banks because we need the cash flows to, to go through. Um, I unfortunately spent 30 years in banking and treasury, and so what we had for a long time was elusiveness of what we would call uh, in ba in-house banking which was the on behalf of, which who's receiving, and in a company that was hard to try and put together. And now, as we're looking at these alternative investments, but at the edge, it's not really where we can see the person and we can touch, but we can reach them out. How do I make sure that I have that trust? So I think that as the technology improves, as the trust in the technology improves, or we get to, the central bank digital currencies, we will see more opportunities in being able to distribute that cash. But at the end of the day, we can't expose those in, you know, who are already hurting to alternative investment, which they cannot control. So that's why for me, it's important in there. And then my second um, important customer is actually the producer and the service providers who are going to use the platform in order to be able to get better access to market and better financial outcomes for themselves. Okay, Randy, let me, let me ask you a quickie on this one. The um, folks are on trying to understand how to get into the market that you're in. They think they want to be in it because it, it, it should be part of your portfolio. I mean, everyone tells you that all the time. But, and you have a clever idea, a really smart idea. And so given the landscape that's out there, where are your clients coming from? What are they saying to you? And where do you get them? Well, we have a number of different stakeholders. We, uh, we invest into the mining space. We don't actually operate mines. And so, uh, so um, one of my group of clients is, of course, the, the operators out there that are looking for capital to help build these projects and, and, uh, and supply the resources themselves. And in today's environment, um, mining stocks aren't very trendy. You want to talk about you know, timing in terms of when you invest in. Uh, if you look at a lot of the resource extraction stocks, they're trading at very low multiples, which, uh, which opens up great opportunities for us because we're not really a mining company. We're an investing company uh, that manages a portfolio, but we do take project risk from a geological, engineering, metallurgical perspective. We've done very well on that front, and, and, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why we've had such great success in growing the company to the, to the status it is. But it's a, it's a great business model, and it's been copied not only in the precious metal space, but it's been copied into the, into the farming space now. This, it's called streaming, where you actually supply some capital up front to help build the infrastructure. And for that, you get a percentage of whatever the product is that comes from that, that mine or that, that farm or that, uh, that resource. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a great business model in terms of, uh, of, of limiting risk. And I was going to say that when it comes to these portfolios, you really, I mean, diversification is a pretty key thing. And then appetite for risk is something that you have to be comfortable with. How, uh, how, how much appetite for risk do you have? Um, I, I think at the foundation of every investment portfolio, there should be some hard assets that are, that are going to be immune. They're all going to suffer from volatility. There's always going to be fluctuations in terms of what someone's willing to pay for, for food, for real estate, for metals. Uh, you're always going to have that. But w what you have to do is have a sort of a foundation thesis that there's going to be a material that's going to have a, a, a growing need uh, by society, and that's that increase in demand. And so, so, again, timing it, as David says, so that you can look at the multiples and figure out when you're at the, the right stage to be investing into that, that area is such an important aspect. But then also making sure that you have it spread around. You don't want to be all in on any 
you know, new technologies because you, you, you know, it's always, it's not so much the technology, it's the vehicle that you're choosing to invest into that technology that is incredibly important in terms of whether you choose right or wrong. And so, so you know, I, I think diversifying, measuring that risk, making sure that you're comfortable with your own appetite for risk, and then looking for whatever vehicle satisfies all those, uh, those requirements. And, uh, and I think, I mean, the opportunity that I see over the next while is just ensuring, I, I, you know, again, I'm just a bit concerned about the financial status of the world, this, the state of the world, the, the inflationary pressures, the weakness of fiat currencies, fiscal mismanagement by governments all around the world. You want to make sure that you're tied on to some, some decent hard assets that will carry value through, in my eyes, and I hate to sound it, the chaos that I think is slowly coming towards us and, uh, and carry that forward. So. Well said. So let's think for a second, and then I want to get onto a, a subject that's germane to Nico. You know, when you look out in the world over the last two years, particularly with the COVID situation, so we realized that supply chain was very important. We realized that offshoring wasn't a great idea, bringing it someplace else in Asia, China, or India, and so forth. It took weeks and weeks and weeks to get products here. We realized that cars couldn't be built. I waited a year to get a car. My wife waited six to seven months to get a washing machine, and when she got it, it didn't work anyway, so she waited another three months to get the real washing machine. General Electric, I mean, Al Edison would turn over in his grave if you knew what was going on. So you had a, a, a horrible situation with that. When you look what was happening in the Ukraine, and all of a sudden the breadbasket of Europe is no longer the breadbasket of Europe, because it's very, very scary, because it's, you can't get the products out. You can't get things in, you can't get things out. So that's a situation that was very bad. Energy was really bad. If you look at every one of the verticals that we play with, it's, it's a very scary environment, but the big but is then that presents opportunity. So when you look what's, what was happening in the world right now, and, and we've done with Global Miami, for example, we know that people want to bring manufacturing back to this part of the world. Why? Well, because you can get it here faster, cheaper, and better, and, and on a more regulated basis, and you're not at the mercy of whatever. You can't have 140 cargo carriers sitting out at sea and then say, why can't I get my Chevrolet? Why can't I have a washing machine? Why can't I get paper? I mean, I, I, you know how much paper I use? I print two magazines a month right now. I can't, I didn't want to tell you how much paper. We couldn't get paper. We had to pay a VIG. I thought it was on the Sopranos. We had to pay a VIG to get paper on top of the paper cost that we would normally pay. Why? Because you couldn't get the paper off the ships because it was out in the sea. So we realized with that whole scenario, that whole scenario, including no wheat coming out of the Ukraine the way it did before, we got to get it here. All of a sudden, there's opportunity. So nearshoring is a very important topic. Nearshoring means investment. The Dominican Republic right now is, is, uh, has the opportunity to create what they want to create through a P3, the, the uh, logistics center of the Caribbean. Why? They're two hours from here by plane. They're almost overnight by cargo. Go talk to the boys and girls over at Seaboard. They'll tell you all about it, and, some, and Maersk and some others. All right, the same thing with Colombia. I just came back from Barranquilla. Barranquilla, Pereira, and now Calais. Colombia wants to be the next logistics center for the, you know, for Latin America environment. Why? Because they're close to the Panama Canal, because they're close to the east coast of the United States. And what does that mean? People are putting hundreds of millions of dollars into that environment. Whether it's in the Dominican, whether it's in Colombia, whether it's gonna be Mexico. Mexico's obvious. We can walk from Mexico. But, and they're the big guy on the block. But the point is, it's opportunity. So, when you see all of this, when you see all of this happening, people are saying, how do I get, those who, who can understand that they believe the bullets aren't real and they're gonna be okay, what do they say to you? This is the opportunity. This, is, this may, be, this may one of the, be one of the best times to invest because you have unusual opportunities that are timely, timely. Dave, hit that really quick for a sec. Okay. Um, please, no offense to anybody who's international minded, but the world still, to my mind, from a certainly tech investor, is hub and spokes. This, United States of America, is the most important market of all for almost every startup company that I deal with. There are some companies that are fantastic that sell in India for India and in China for China, they're developing their middle classes. But if you are a startup trying to build something world scale, 
you generally have to come and sell it to the large banks in America, large uh, mining companies, uh, large creative companies, and, and it, it's the U.S. that really leads. So our our, we invest in Canada. Those companies, first market they try and go to after Canada is right to the U.S. Our companies in Israel, they try and come to the U.S. Our European companies, they come to the U.S. We have the best and most robust capital markets, innovative technology, leading universities, et cetera, all the good stuff. We have problems, no doubt. And I'm not saying it in any um, patronizing way or to say that we're better than other people, but this is the market that you want to be in. I'm very big on Latin America. I think that there are enormous opportunities in this Western hemisphere. I once heard from the Irish ambassador in Israel, he said, you know, David, people think it's the Chinese century. No, they're wrong. It's the North American century and the Western Hemisphere century, because between Canada, the US, and Latin America, you have all the resources you need. You have the minerals, you have the industry, you have the capital markets, and you have technology. And you have rule of law, at least in the northern part, mostly. And um, so I would urge you to think very strong about, put most of your things here. Diversification is fine, but the major market is here. 100%, and again, again, Miami gets it. Miami was there a long time ago, understanding it, and that's why we have the largest influx of immigration, corporate immigration, that has existed in a long, long time. It's changed the landscape. John Vieth. I was gonna say, though, I'm gonna challenge you, Africa is the place to go, because what happens is that, no, I, I mean it, because this is where we're going to have the biggest, um, Demographic, demographic growth, absolutely. And then also the opportunity for investment in things like waste your energy. Namibia just uncovered more oil and gas. We can actually do it in a way which is not going to be as harmful and which is going to be. So to me, there's that part, but what's missing, and I keep not hearing, is the educational opportunity. We are, like it or not, in the scope of the fourth industrial revolution. And if we look back, you know, so you were talking about trends, IR3, Industrial Revolution 3, took 100 years for people to go from that poverty back to functionality. So we have an opportunity to invest in training. And yes, I want a lot of people in the greater north, in the west, to be providing me the skills that I need. But I also need to make sure that we do those skill sets in those places like Africa and Latin America, because this is like giving them a well and not teaching them how to upkeep that well. If we don't teach them how to upkeep, there's no water and we have the problem again. No, I'm, I'm totally pro-Africa, et cetera, and it, particularly it's been growing incredibly fast over the last 30 years. Most people don't know that. It's been growing much faster than Europe because Europe has very sclerotic policies and, Europe, and Africa has been trying to deregulate, which is a good thing, deregulate everywhere, please. All right, I'm going to hold it there because we only have about a minute and a half left. So I want to do 30 seconds each, a little wrap-up. Nico, tell us in 30 seconds, where do you see it going? Where is your industry going? Where is the investment in? And then you can do that in 30 seconds. We're getting you a room here for the weekend. Go play golf. All right. I see the, the biggest opportunities, obviously, in emerging tech and alternate investments. And by that, I mean um, we have we, – we, we invest in alternate assets like sports franchises. Uh, you know, um, I, I think that's the key. Anything that's integrative off of AI technology is uh, probably going to be a safe bet for the next five, ten years. Thank you, Randy. Well, I think uh, you know the the demand for resources, and especially with uh, some of the changes that that society is looking for in terms of uh, reducing our own footprints as we uh, as we thrive as a society. Um, you know, there needs to be some hard assets at the base of that. I think what you're looking for is, is organizations or groups that are embracing the new technology to make sure that when they're, uh, when they're extracting those resources, uh, whether it's farming or, or mining, uh, are delivering the best value to all the stakeholders. And that's not just the shareholders, but it's the, it's the, the, you know, the actual producers themselves and the neighbors, the communities. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good challenging world in terms of working with, and you gotta make sure that you're doing the best you can for everyone around you. David, 30 seconds, real quick. I know we're over by almost a minute, but let's do it. Okay, so all these folks are in various alternative areas. Genevieve working in the area of blockchain. We're looking for that, we're excited about it. Um, it's much more real than the, some of the Bitcoin and, and, and um, speculative assets. This is for service for big companies to use and for individuals as well. International trade, better. 
Um, you're talking about hard assets. No one disagrees. Metals, very important uh, area. So that's an area to look at. Uh, your area, there's always need for creativity, and AI will never replace the human brain. It should be augmenting. And I'll just pause there and just say, the future is going to be brighter. There are, it's darkest before the dawn. Don't give up. Stay committed. Lean forward, and you'll do well. Don't get I think human capital, that's where the investment needs to be in. How do we get everybody to get a chance to get a leg up, be it underserved communities, underrepresented, um, really looking at how do we get more women to be involved? We're talking technology, technology. How do we get them to be part of that technology and being part of this? And we're about to take you, to, I believe, to lunch and think about it. This is all going to go back to the food because if you have to live, you must eat. Just terrific. I want to thank our panelists for being here today. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us and being part of this event. And on behalf of myself, Rich Rothman, I want to say thank you so much to the summit. I want to have everybody enjoy their, their time here at the Biltmore Hotel. I know Gene and Tom would appreciate that too. Take care. God bless. Thank you very much.